first one, Quest Corp. It's used the last couple of years to ramp up its presence in the staffing and the IT solution services, be it through organic expansion or acquisitions. While there is no denying that both verticals have a lot of money to be made, one also needs to look at the cost of buying some of the companies and if growth falters, would some of these areas see some moderation? Uh, frankly, the conversation in the last couple of days is, where are the jobs? Let's pose all of these questions to Ajit Isaac, Chairman and Managing Director at Quest Corp. He joins us right now on the show. Mr. Isaac, good to have you. Thanks so much for joining in. Uh, if I can first ask you a broad brush question, which is not necessarily only on Quest Corp. A lot of uh, conversations, uh, varied numbers, divergent numbers about the job scenario in India. What have you made of all of this? Because the high, f the high frequency decibels that we hear all speak about jobs not being there in the first place. So let's take a look at it uh, from two dimensions. One internally from Quest and second uh, at a broader uh, view of, uh, at the economy itself. At Quest last year, we added about 100,000 people to our company. So which means uh, you know, we are close to about 300,000 people right now among the you know, two or three largest private sector employers. We uh, added effectively 1% of the total workforce last year to the Indian economy, which adds about, let's say, 10 million people. So maybe the largest hiring company in India in the last one year. Uh, so from that standpoint, I can't say that there are no jobs available. But having said that, you know, rather than looking back, if you look forward, I think there are two or three key, that key drivers to growth in the Indian economy. One is that uh, uh, post elections, I think there will be a spurt in growth. There'll be further investment. I think after all the uh, uh, conversations and the ele election rhetoric is off, people focus back on uh, driving jobs and uh, driving investments that will uh, further spur the economy, regardless of whoever is in power. The second point is there's a formalization process of the economy going on post demonetization and uh, the various initiatives of successive governments in India. So that, I think, will lead to a lot of movement of jobs from the informal sector to the formal sector. One of the prime uh, uh, beneficiaries of such a movement will be a large uh, hiring company like Westcorp. So this, I think, will be another benefit to us. The third is uh, there are specific sectors that will begin to uh, crank up again. Uh, my sense is that infrastructure will look up because uh, there is a pent up demand for infrastructure in India. Infrastructure has a drip down effect on the rest of the economy as it picks up. So all this, I think, portends to a situation where we'll see more jobs being created. Uh, that's my that's my uh, that's my take on the overall situation of jobs. Now, how does this tie in with uh, what Quest does, not just necessarily over the next one or two quarters, frankly, um, I, I, that, that would be a bit of a pedestrian conversation at this at this point of time. The, the thought uh, process would be how do you see this business building out over the next two or three or five years? Because, uh, you know, I, again, divergent views here. Some people who are looking at the very short term talk about how their operating performances are in line, performance is steady in some of the key verticals, at some quarter it is not so, and how you're doing versus your competitors. But I'm just thinking out loud over the next three to five years, if organized staffing, is going to become big, uh, then what's the vision that you have for what the business could be in March 2022, say? So that's a great question. <laughs> I agree that uh, you know, numbers are available for everybody to read off. You've consist consistently outperformed the market and competition. Uh, we've had a con uh, compounded annual growth rate in excess of 40% across the last five, seven years. So the numbers are there for people to see. But where are we going? I think that's what's the key right now. You know, we are transitioning from a five vertical company into developing just three platforms for Quest. The three platforms for Quest will be workforce management, asset management, and tech-led customer lifecycle management. So that's the big picture, that we are transitioning from verticals to three platforms. And what will operate in these three platforms? In, a, in let's say, the workforce management platform, there is a need to generate supply of people there's a need to manage the recruitment, the identification, recruitment, and onboarding of these people. There's a need to pay salaries and invoice clients for, for each of them. So that's what we hope to build in, build in by way of technology into the platform. And this, I think, is a game-changing process for us. In asset management, we've got basically three types of assets. We've got uh, real estate assets that we manage in the facility space, uh, about 220 million square feet of space, 
with about 60,000 odd people engaged in that, clearly the market leader in India in that. The second one is telecom assets, where we manage or have been managing close to about 75,000 towers out of maybe about 400,000 plus towers in India. So significant presence in that space. And the third one is industrial asset management, where we manage power plants, steel plants, uh, large industrial equipment and the non-core equipment available at some of these plants. We have more than 6,000 to 7,000 technicians working in this space again. Uh, the country leader in a, in a, through a brand called Hoffenkons. So this is uh, the asset management space. And in the technology space, we have a JV, which we run with the Tata Group, uh, called Connect Business Solutions, previously called Tata Business Support Solutions, among the two or three largest BPOs in India, employs about 30,000 people. We're looking to add further assets to uh, all of these verticals. Uh, but I think in each of them, uh, the key point is that we've got a leadership position and we're transitioning to a more digital approach of serving customers. So that's the big picture. Interesting. If I can pick your brains on the last point that you just made. A lot of people uh, have uh, sounded the death knell for uh, the kind of uh, what quote unquote they say is routine uh, job work. Not, I mean, forget the BPO services, but the IT services picture by and large. A lot of people have done that. Now, my question to you is when you're talking about hiring more people within that BPO vertical that you spoke about, uh, do you foresee unhindered growth prospects for the next few years, which prompts you to talk about expansion in this business? Is not competition from the slightly lower cost neighbors in East Asia catching up or has not already caught up? So uh, that's a good contextual question. Um, I think uh, we are uh, the the type of growth that we're going to experience at uh, our BPO business is going to be non-voice, non-data, non-headcount led. What we're focusing now is developing more processes that we'll run, not necessarily number of people we'll add. So that's where we're moving away from a headcount led approach to a process led approach. In delivering a process, uh, the number of uh, bots that we're using. Uh, machine learning that we are now investing in, uh, artificial intelligence that is available in some of the products that we are buying to service our customers is significant. So uh, I think you'll see a company that's growing from just uh, taking voice calls into managing processes, which may include voice. And part of it is delivered voice, but usually at the first end is delivered through automated processes. So that's the direction of growth and trajectory that that company will take. Okay. Uh, in in some sense, Mr. Isaac, do you uh, would would a, would the sector that you are in right now, uh, in some ways resemble maybe what IT would have been? I don't know at what time cycle, but at maybe a few years back, wherein it's a it's it's a it's a space which is organized, managing a lot of people, a lot of people within different companies, yes, but doing homogeneous kind of work, and in a high growth trajectory. The question, the only difference that I see, and, and maybe correct me if I'm wrong, but the difference that I see is that that business since its inception had very high EBITDA operating margins. The nature of your business doesn't leave that high an EBITDA profile for a business of your kind. Yeah, so the nature of uh, services performed in both the cases were different and the margin structures were also therefore different and therefore you'd find a differential EBITDA between what IT delivered in the early years and what we're delivering right now. But the point is with digitization that we're doing and the automation of processes, we have a chance to leapfrog from one generation to another one. The second thing is that if you measure us on return on capital employed over a period of time, we will, we will be near about uh, the IT companies as we progress forward. We've raised a boatload of cash in the last two years through our IPO and IPP. Therefore, our uh, return on capital has been uh, has been subdued for the last couple of years because of the expansion of the capital base. But after the capital is fully deployed and the cash conversion is happening in from EBITDA to earnings, uh, you'll find that our return on capital is going up. Uh, but the nature of business will be different from what we do here from what IT services do, uh, except that we have uh, also an extensive use of, uh, of technology in the services that we deliver. One point to note here is that most of our services are annuity-based services, whereas in uh, in the IT services space, most of them are project-based services for shorter lifespans. So the predictability of earnings is higher here, but the margin structure will be lower. 
Interesting. You you reckon that uh, the last couple of questions really on this conversation, you reckon that your return on capital employed, which uh, again, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, I don't think I am, has has declined from what it was in F515. I, I think there the numbers suggest it was maybe northwards of 20 to 23 times to about uh, 14 odd times or 14 odd percent or 12 odd percent in the current years. Can it revert back to those numbers right. in the next That's year four? Right. Yeah, so you know, uh, after you're right. So after 15, it was year 16 when we did our IPO, and year 17 when we did our IPT. So through a combination of two, uh, you know, public market exercises, we raised almost about uh, 1,200 crores um, on a much smaller equity base. So the deployment of that capital and the returns from that capital will take about two, three years. There's a lag time. So post the lag time, we expect it to come back to 20% numbers. In fact, our internal target is stay above 20%. That's where we are gold at. Uh, if you look at our cash conversions right now, at the beginning of this year, we had a cash EBITDA conversion of maybe about 30, 32%. Last quarter, it was about 44%. Uh, Q4, we expect it to be about 46%. So we've grown almost about 50% in cash conversion in one year, which I think is significant and points to an increase in the return on capital over time. So that's the trending in our company right now in terms of cash, uh, earnings and EPS, therefore. Typically, a, a market leader or otherwise will not be able to outperform the sector uh, in a meaningful way. I mean, that's what the usual parameters are. So would you reckon that the sector by itself will be in a high growth phase and you'll be able to do maybe marginally better than that? I mean, organized staffing, I, I believe there are only two or three listed ones and maybe a few others which are unlisted, but it's a small sector relatively. Sure. So there are two, three developments here which you have to factor into computing our growth. First is that we, we will grow a little bit faster than the market. So let's say the market's growing 15 to 18 percent, we grow 20 to 22 percent. The second one is that there's a formalization of economy taking place. In the formalization pro process, there will be specific projects that will come to us, one-off projects in a year, which cannot be factored into an annual program structure, so to say. They are, uh, you know, one-off things that happen. And every year we've seen a few of them come, which really give, gives us a boost of one or two percent. Add to that is some acquisitions that we'll also layer on. So if you add it all up, I think we have a good chance of, uh, we have a good uh, uh, probability of uh, securing growth in excess of 20% in the staffing business on a year-on-year -year basis, even in spite of the fact that we are a market leader and we have a large base already. Interesting. And with better return ratios and higher margins. Okay, let's see what it does to the bottom line. I just have one final question, Mr. Isaac, and that is uh, uh, not quite related to growth, but you made an interesting uh, diversion of sorts, right, with that football club that you now have stakes in. Why that? I mean, we've seen past history of at least some companies making these unrelated maneuvers not quite paying off, either in terms of returns or at times even leading to losses. It's happened to a number of companies. Why have you done this? So the investment here was uh, not as a uh, not as a sort of uh, a business investment that we were making. We invested all of 10 crores to buy 70% of a marquee club in India, perhaps the Liverpool of India called East Bengal Football Club. It has an, it has a fan base in excess of a million people, even on its Facebook site. Uh, the investment has gone off very well. Uh, when we invested in the club, it was at the bottom of the league. Uh, they have a last match that's uh, due this Saturday. If they win that and if there's a related development in the league, we could end up being number one in India, representing India for the official uh, Asian Federations Cup that will come uh, as the number one club of India. So it's, it's a terrific uh, progression for our asset from where it was to where it is today, uh, from when we invested. Why we invested in this was to get our branding through a perpetual asset that we will own. So we've never invested in branding before. For a small cost of 10 crores, which is effectively about uh, you know one third of our overall branding costs in a year. We're able to own a permanent property, and this has worked well for us because this brand reaches out to a cross section of society that cuts across age, religion, geography, etc. So uh, we are quite uh, happy with the results we've achieved. Just as a just as another thought, uh, the value of this asset uh, is uh, maybe ten times greater than what we paid for it. Uh, if you look at comparable transactions that have taken place in the same sector recently. So we're in the money and uh, you know we're happy with what it has achieved for us so far. We hope it does win and does represent and if so, do let us know. We'll cheer for that as well. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Isaac, for laying some ground here. Uh, great talking to you. Thank you. Cheers. Okay, that's... Uh, uh,
uh, Quest Corp.